Hello, my name's Chris, what's yours? Welcome back to Marathon Man, where I'm going through Doctor Who from the very beginning. And you join me as we kick off season 10 with the very first multi-Doctor story. I have long been convinced that watching Doctor Who in order from the very beginning is the best way of watching the show. It's certainly my favourite way of doing it. There is so much of it that drinking it all in, in context, is such a rewarding experience. Not only do you find yourself watching the stories with uh, a different understanding from before, but you also sort of like experience the uh, the show itself morph and mould to uh, accommodate new doctors, new production teams, and therefore it sort of like shifts into these distinct eras. You watch the same show throughout, but after a time, something comes along that causes you to look back and remember. Remember what the show was like in its past, and in so doing, you notice just how far it's come. These moments on a marathon can be dizzying as you negotiate the initial nostalgia burst before reflecting on the show of days gone by before appreciating the current form in a new light. At least that's my experience of it anyway. With the show entering its 10th year, the biggest and most direct hit would seem to be obvious. Now that there have been three of them, to bring Doctors past and present together in the same story is a tantalising idea. Now, of course, it is to be expected for anniversary hoo-hahs and become one of the things a lot of speculation instantly jumps to when discussing the future of the show. Here, though, it had never been done. And the very idea of doing it feels, instead of the norm it might one day be, really rather audacious. It's given weight in the story as well. Much is made by the Time Lords of how this must never happen, but the situation is so dire and needs must. That makes sense. It's never happened before and the implications are mind-boggling so that the Time Lords are so reluctantly willing to bring the uh, Doctors together and expend what little energy they have left doing it does make the Jeopardy feel greater than usual. However, and I'll get this out of the way as early as possible, in one of Baker and Martin's inherent scripting traits, I actually feel like I'm told things are so bad rather than being made to feel that things are that bad you see i don't truly see why the doctors have to come together no more so than you know a couple of them would have come in handy in any previous story up to this point uh, and so it all just feels and this will sound silly just like an excuse to bring back hartnell and troughton now i do know that that's what it is as a shindig it is wonderful as a story though it sort of doesn't really put the work in. Loath as I am to jump so far ahead, I actually think that the Day of the Doctor is uh, the best example of uh, bringing uh, various Doctors together but still working as a story and not just a framing device. The idea of Omega and his fate is an interesting one and is certainly worth exploring as is the universe of antimatter. But I do have to admit to having a nagging feeling that for such an auspicious occasion, the Three Doctors doesn't actually work hard enough to earn its Three Doctors. I'm getting that out of the way at the start because it really is the only real negative takeaway I have from this story. And it is quite a checkpoint as well. So even though I know the marathon has had sort of like a couple of uh, short fallow periods, to have reached it has still sort of taken me aback a little bit. The story treats its previous doctors as relics of the past, which, you know, they are. And so it serves as a very sobering reminder of all the ground covered up until this point. And even though I can't exactly say that I consider it, you know, a smooth story in its own right, it is brilliant brilliant fun. It's always been a highlight of mine ever since I first saw it. Now, um, I don't think it will ever truly bother the uh, top 10 best stories list, but it would probably have a place on a similar, on a, you know, similar but separate top 10 most fun stories list. Um, uh, and I say that it's been a highlight ever since I uh, first saw it. And the first time I saw it, now that I think about it, it was actually 
relatively quite late. My first brief taste of it came when I sat down to watch the 30 Years in the TARDIS documentary go out, and I was presented with the dandy and a clown scene. In a relatively apt demonstration of how this story disobeys the rules in favour of being a Doctor mashup, to the point where it kind of ceases to be a regular story and takes on the form of something else, I was absolutely sure that it couldn't be a proper episode. Three Doctors all together? In my little nine-year-old brain, I filed it away as a clip from a sort of like unofficial spin-off. There's no way it could have happened in actual Doctor Who, it just didn't seem right. Then when I realised that it was a Pertwee story proper, I almost could not believe it. Never mind believing it though, I couldn't wait to see it. I did wait though. I actually didn't catch it until it was out on DVD. It was 2003, I was at university, uh, and it was almost 10 years since I'd actually learned of the story's existence. And I devoured it and I loved it. That love was purely on its own terms as well, as it stood alone, radiating through the grotty but beloved attic room I had in my tired student digs. The thing is, and to return to my initial point at the beginning of this video, it has so much more potency when viewed as part of a marathon. Getting to it feels like an achievement, and for reaching it, we are rewarded with some of the greatest gifts the show has given to us. In context, William Hartnell's reappearance, and like, how lovely is it to be able to say those words, means something. The tragedy of how ill he actually was does result in him sort of like being removed from the plot more than is desirable, but in a weird way it actually helps him maintain this sort of like other status, like a, a, a mythical being, which is oddly very appropriate. His doctor was an absolute delight and he was instrumental in the success of the show. And his departure from it was less than ideal and his absence was very keenly felt and at times still continues to be. That his ghost has hung over the show since he left may not have been apparent, but his reappearance here clicks that into focus retroactively. He's here, he's back, the real Doctor is back. And yet it would have been beautiful to have had him fully integrated and interacting full-bloodedly with his replacements. And that is something of a regret when this story is viewed in isolation. But watched as the 65th serial of the ongoing Doctor Who story, then the simple fact of his presence manages to be electrifying. How I have missed him and how tantalizingly just out of reach he remains. Yeah, it's emotional and being able to see him one last time is a lovely, lovely postscript. Of course, he's not the only returning Doctor as we also get Troughton, who I'm no less pleased to see again. I missed Hartnell, I continue to miss Hartnell, but don't think for a second that that means that I don't miss Troughton as well. As with the first, the second Doctor's absence also left a gaping void, and as good as Pertwee can be, and as capable as he is at being larger than life enough to fill that void, I have had a slightly bumpier ride with him for him to have comforted me completely in the absence of both Hartnell and Troughton. Troughton's more substantial role than Hartnell's has some very clear benefits, not just for this story, but also for the show as a whole. He is a reminder of the show and character as before, and perhaps more than Delgado, considering he's both playing the same character and a time capsule from the past, he forces Pertwee to up his game. That isn't just confined to the three Doctors either, because Pertwee seems to have been kicked up the arse by Troughton coming back, and it's something he takes with him for the rest of his time on Doctor Who. Patrick Troughton coming back seems to, feels like he re-energised almost everybody involved in the show. Like, he, he had that effect, I think. And really cleverly, and a little bit touchingly actually, he eventually defers to the third Doctor. He's older and wiser his. It's such a tiny little moment on the page, but he's actually one of the most seismic moments in the story for me, because those four words have coloured my perception of my entire perception of the instances where Doc the Doctor meets other versions of himself. One of the most frequently asked questions in The Three Doctors is why do the Third and Second Doctors defer to the First Doctor uh, for help and guidance and advice when he's the youngest? Well to me the answer seems obvious in that all of the Doctors would respect the youngest Doctor because he was the original. Or so they think. I know this is where people will point to the Timeless Child as having sort of like altered that. But uh, for me, it still works because, you know, until the 13th Doctor found out about the whole Timeless Child uh, revelation, all of the Doctors thought that the first Doctor was the original anyway, so they'd still defer to him the same way. And they have all changed drastically from that 
body that they thought was their original. Yeah, they've taken bits of him with them, uh, but they've all changed. Like they're in a completely different body from the one they thought they were born in. So that's gonna have to, that's gonna freak them out somewhat. Uh, if they were to then meet the incarnation that they consider to be uh, their true self, uh, then I do think that they would defer to them. It's not the same as uh, I think Stephen Moffat said this about how if you uh, went back in time and met yourself as a uh, as a teenager why would you assume uh, that the teenager you know is better and it's very different for the doctor because let's it's not just a case of meeting your younger self it's a case of meeting what you may consider to be your true self and yes the timeless child has played with that so I understand completely why some people uh, 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 don't like the revelation just for its own sake we can talk about how well it was seeded into the show and how well it was handled at a different point but if you're uh, against the timeless child revelation just on its own terms I do sympathize because obviously it plays with this idea of Hartnell now no longer being the original but for this to work uh, for me it's just that the doctor has to believe Hartnell's the original one as up until the 13th doctor they all did so, like I say, for me, that still works. And so what this means for the three Doctors is that given the um, the Hartnell blueprint Doctor is still ever so slightly out of reach, Troughton's Doctor does, on some level, end up feeling a little bit like uh, an imposter. He's not the original, and he's not the current one. He's sitting somewhere in the middle. So when he does say... He's older and wiser his. It comes across as hugely respectful to the incumbent Doctor, as well it should. From this point on, none of these multi-Doctor stories will have an actual proper appearance from William Hartnell, the original Doctor. And this is why that moment in the Three Doctors has shaped how I view these types of stories. After this story, they really are all imposters. And so the only Doctor to defer to is the more experienced one. And the more experienced one is always going to be the incumbent. One of my favourite things about the Day of the Doctor is how Tennant's Doctor is not written or performed as to overshadow Smith's. The Tenth Doctor in that episode is very often quite bumbling and daft, getting almost everything wrong. And it's a very wise move in making sure the incumbent Doctor always remains the leading man. And I think the germs of it are in here, specifically when Troughton says, older and wiser head. Two separate actors playing their own incarnations of the Doctor opposite each other can, because the each interpretation of the Doctor is different depending on the actor playing them, um, uh, can be in danger of feeling just like two characters interacting like any two characters would. But care is put in to making it feel like, while that is the case because they're different incarnations and they're very different, they, it does feel like the same man three times. And it's only done very subtly, and it's more through the performance than the scripting. But Troughton saying those four words older and wiser head sort of like it makes the idea of the doctors coming together coalesce into the same man meeting i think it's fantastic obviously there's the regulars to go into as well uh, uh there's a slight shift in how brigadier lethbridge stewart uh is is conveyed uh he becomes a bit more comedically bumbling um uh, I guess for the sake of the party vibe, it doesn't really matter too much, but it, it is noticeable. Um, Benton uh, continues to impress, and Stephen Thorne as Omega is a really strong presence. What a voice! Uh, Joe Grant is uh, adorable. She's already got a really brilliant relationship with the Third Doctor. She forges quite a strong one uh, in a very short space of time with uh, the Second Doctor as well. So uh, everyone's sort of on top of the game. The guest stars. Uh, 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 are good and while we've got all of those to talk about this is the doctor's party uh, and so um, I wanted to devote more attention to talking to the doctor and uh, g give him uh, his due reverence all three of him so a fairly flimsy story but what a sugar rush 333 episodes in and I've just had to say goodbye to two doctors all over again that is sad, but I am left with a third Doctor who has changed slightly, and changed for the better. He's also, after three seasons stuck on Earth, a free Time Lord again. So, once again, the show resets. Marvellous. 
greeting William Hartnell and Patrick Troughton like the old friends they are. <sighs> Time wasting? It's a small complaint, but there's plenty of examples of like pure padding. There's a shot of a jeep for ages. There's uh, Tyler's escape proving fruitless immediately after he tries it, which if they'd been excised would have just meant more time able to be spent with the doctors. As ever, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this little birthday party, then you know how YouTube works. Please do give it a like and a big old share. And what do you think of the three doctors? Is it as heady a sugar rush as I think it is? Or is it a bit of a letdown when it comes to celebrating the show's 10th season? Is it lovely to see Hartnell and Trenton again? Or does it open the show up to a little bit too much navel gazing going forward? Let me know in the comments below and I'll see you back here soon for a trip into a mini scope. So if you don't want to miss that, hit the subscribe button, clang the cloister bell, and let's get cut down to size.